another millennium from this time, were an archaeologist of the future to contemplate the ruin of London, what civilization would they imagine? With what spectral people thronged the streets? What armies of ghosts march through shattered arches and parade past tributes to long forgotten victories? The faces of the smashed and fallen statues would look out from the past. Their faces, those of an imperial people, of a nation certain of its place in history. Their monuments, proud boasts of power, allegories of courage, symbolic of mastery. Carved in subjection and servitude, the races of the world would stand in submission and defeat. The golden years of the British imperial era the time when these monuments were built lies at the very limit both of living memory and of our ability to record events with moving images. Survivors of these times lived them only as the smallest of infants. Pictures that reveal this world, some of the earliest blurred and shaky cinema film, these are pictures of a lost world. In 1897, Victoria, Queen Empress, celebrated her Diamond Jubilee, 60 years of rule. British self-confidence and might stood unchallenged. The parades, triumphal celebrations of the spirit of a small European nation who ruled a quarter of the Earth's surface and people. A nation whose trade and industry dominated the world economy. A nation whose wealth and power were envied by all others. A nation who believed itself to represent the best and highest civilization. Who saw itself as the very culmination of history. Yet, only a few years after these scenes, the British Empire began its slow, long, unstoppable fall. By 1901, Victoria was dead. And as the kings of the great powers and the soldiers of the empire marched behind the Queen Empress's coffin, Already, the might and confidence of the British nation was crumbling, eroding under the flow of history. In 1901, a bitter war was being fought by the Empire inside the Empire, and an aggressive Germany and vigorous America challenged British military and industrial supremacy. In London, in the shadow of the British Parliament, stands a statue of another Queen, Bodicea, killed by the Roman Empire nearly two millennia before. The statue boasts that over a world that the Romans never knew, the British ruled. And Britain's empire was huge, covering vast areas of the globe. On the board is the map of the world. The schoolchildren of the imperial age were proudly taught to colour the empire red. in other European empires only emphasized their insignificance compared to that of Britain. School atlases of the time proudly compared the size of imperial territories with that of the mother country. The British Empire encircled the world. It was a proud boast that the sun never set on the Union Jack. It is a mistake, though, to suppose that this empire was a great superstate, a single society and a single civilization. The empire had been gathered at different times for different reasons, for hard-headed profit, for military power, to confound the ambitions of others, sometimes for no better reason than national vanity. The different patches of red, from the vast expanses of India and Africa to the tiniest of dots that speckled the oceans, were ruled in different ways. Much of Africa and many of the smallest outposts around the world were called crown colonies and ruled by governors appointed by London. Some of these colonies, those with large minority populations of British settlers, were almost independent and allowed to rule their own internal affairs with elections in which native people rarely could vote. Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa were called 
the dominions. In these lands, white settlers had often ruthlessly displaced native peoples and had created pieces of Britain overseas. By the time of the Golden Age of Empire, the Dominions were nation-states, free to make their own way. The leaders of the Dominions regularly gathered in London and spoke as equals to the British government. In this way, the Dominions were part of the illusion of the British Empire. Learning the lesson of history from the experience of the North American Empire that had been lost, Britain had allowed the Dominions early independence, thinking of them as the grown-up children of the Empire as the members of a family that was expected to loyally pull together. Unlike all other parts of the empire, the dominions were the subject of actively promoted policies of immigration. They were places to which the mother country exported its surplus population. No other European empire had this type of relationship with its former colonies. The British Empire's belief that the children would someday grow up and leave home was to shape the history of all parts of the empire and the peculiar, unique way in which the empire was to fall. If the dominions could be called the children of the empire, then India was its heart. In 1912, George V newly raised to his throne, visited India as King of Great Britain and Emperor of India, an ancient Mughal title that had been added by the Victorians to the long list of titles borne by the British monarch. India, the Raj, was in fiction, in myth and in truth the jewel in the crown of the empire. To the British people, India was a land of fable, mysterious, esoteric and glamorous. Ruling such a country only made Britain greater. At a great public audience, known by the Indian word Durbar, in Delhi in 1912, the King Emperor received tributes and the pledges of loyalty from the native Indian princes. The Indian Empire was just that, an empire in itself. A map of British India is a patchwork of territories, each with their own identity. Fifteen major languages were spoken, plus countless dialects. There was a multitude of ethnic and religious differences. Some areas were ruled directly by British colonial governors, while others, the princely states, were semi-autonomous, ruled by native Indian princes, the Maharajas, the Rajas, the Nizams, and Nawabs. Just as their medieval ancestors had pledged loyalty to the Indian Mughal emperor, the princes were content to rule as little kings beneath the British emperor. The princes cooperated with the British and were fabulously wealthy. There would always be a staff of British advisers at the princely court, with British officers commanding their little armies. To the British people, there appeared something that was almost miraculous about their domination of India. In 1912, less than 100,000 British troops and barely 1,000 colonial administrators ruled an Indian population of then more than 250 million. At the very head of the Raj stood the Viceroy, usually drawn from the British aristocracy. The Viceroys were remote and distant figures. One Viceroy confessed that in seven years of ruling India, he had never handled or seen the native Indian currency. History always challenges the present to understand what people in the past really felt and what they really believed. The British, in the glorious years of their empire, saw a world with no doubts. A world in which their nation was the strongest power and a world which they had a moral duty to rule. This was not a cynical civilization. They believed what they said. Empires throughout history have fallen violently and suddenly, but this was not the fate of the British Empire. The story of the fall of the British Empire is a complex weave of time, an adding up of countless small strands of events. The Empire did not crash to ruin, rather it's a history of a crack here, a crumbling there, an exposed fault, a slow decay. The British Empire's fall is a story of a growing weakness, of tiredness, a physical failure to stay strong. 
It's the story of the Empire's subjects growing to nationhood, often as the direct result of the Empire's efforts, of the world literally seeing through the Emperor's clothes, seeing through the illusion of British supremacy. The fall of the Empire is the story of Britons no longer believing, of Britons growing up. If there is a single turning point in history, a moment when the tide of events, ideas and belief changed, when the Empire can be said to have begun its fall, it was the Boer War. This is some of the earliest war newsreel, some of it transparently staged. These are images at the edge of filmed history, from the very start of the last century. This war was fought in South Africa from 1899 to 1901. The war began as Dutch descended settlers rebelled against the extension of British rule further into Africa. The Boers fought to keep their biblical vision of a promised land and themselves as a divinely chosen people with the right to virtually enslave the African population. The British were driven to war by avaricious industrial interests, hungry to gain control of newly discovered mineral wealth, gold and diamonds. It was in the Boer War that the illusion of unchallengeable British strength would shatter. Britain expected easy victory, but the Boer army, an army of farmers, invented guerrilla warfare, which the British could barely understand. Fighting was to drag on, finally tying down a British army of more than half a million. The Boers were defeated by the British invention of concentration camps, in which they ruthlessly imprisoned almost the entire Boer population. Fighting ended in 1901, but did not end the tensions in South Africa. When South Africa became a dominion, it chose to make its own version of history. Of all Britain's family, South Africa was to have the longest and most painful fall from empire. The aftershocks of the South African War would reverberate for nearly 90 years. We live in a present which believes that all peoples and all races are deserving of respect and the same standards of human rights. It is a present which enshrines those rights in international law. It requires little knowledge of the past to know that the British, like all Europeans of the time, believed in their inherent racial superiority over non-white peoples. It is perhaps harder for us in the present to realize that the ruled, the non-Europeans, were, with very few exceptions, equally convinced of their own inferiority. My country is a small, a small, but under the protection of the British government, I feel that I can claim that its development has been exceptionally rapid. I'm very glad <coughs> to see you in my country and hope that the pictures which you are taking will be of interest to those who see them. The 19th century had been a history of constant victory by European armies over indigenous peoples who had seen their military might annihilated by superior European military skill, discipline and European weaponry. Non-Europeans saw the imperialists as possessing a bewildering array of technologies that confirmed the foreigners' mastery. The dominance of European peoples was believed right, just and natural. The poet of the British Empire, Rudyard Kipling, created the phrase, the white man's burden. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness, on fluttered folk and wild, your new court sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Throughout the territories they ruled, the governors of the British Empire saw their role as being the bringers of civilization, of law and order. If ruled peoples were not seen as out-and-out -out savages, then they were believed to be infant nations that needed protection, nurturing and education. Despite the fact that much of its early wealth had been built around slavery and the effective looting of the East, the British Empire was proud of being the European nation whose navy had suppressed the slave trade. Indian society, for all its long history of art, architecture and literature, was a society from which the British were proud to have eliminated sooty, the ritual human sacrifice of a woman on her husband's funeral pyre, and Tugi, a religious cult based on murder. Those Indian princes that paid homage to the King Emperor at the Durbar no longer had arbitrary powers of life or death over their subjects. 
It was a characteristic of the British Empire that everywhere the British went, they established courts of law and a sophisticated legal system. It was a code of law that was extended to all the Empire's subjects, whatever their race, the principles of fairness and justice. The empire has come to appear as an endless round of polo and cricket, of tea drinking and garden parties, floating dresses and smart uniforms in hot climates. It would be wrong to be misled by romantic nostalgia. The empire was a network of military power. And the empire was a business, a vast network of global trade that spoke the language of profit and loss. The empire was a huge market for British industrial goods. And a flow of raw materials and foodstuffs moved in the opposite direction. The British merchant shipping fleet, the largest in the world. The launch of any addition to this fleet was major news. But it is not a fiction that the British did create a distinct imperial lifestyle. Throughout their history, the people of the British Isles have tended to instinctively dislike foreignness and always seek to recreate home, no matter how far away and how alien the surroundings. Much imperial work was routine. The life in garrison towns, with little to do, created vast empty spaces of leisure time time that would be filled with parties, English sports and country activities. English parish churches were built in the heat of Africa and India, in which the British could worship the god that had ordained their rule. Horses and horsemanship were universal obsessions. Race courses were built throughout the empire. At Calcutta, the ceremonial of the Royal Ascot races in England was recreated, with the Viceroy progressing down the course. The races, just as at Ascot, were social occasions for the ladies of fashionable society. Every community of expatriate Britons had their own gymkhana, a hybrid Anglo-Indian word. These scenes of the imperial classes at horseplay are identical to those of the English counties. It's hard to find any detail in these pictures from India in the 1930s that reveals any sign of India or Indians. The English were able to indulge their passion for hunting. Hunting for bigger game than could be found in any English midland field. The courage and skill, the character required for the hunt, were believed necessary qualities for the imperial administrator. The imperial lifestyle was lived at a grander level to that in Britain itself. Houses became palaces, servants numbered in legions. Many knew that when their imperial days were over, they might return to England and their palace turn into a modest cottage decorated with alien Indian or African curios. Watching these images of the empire at pleasure, it's possible sometimes to detect an underlying sadness. Some who stood at the viceroy's elbow knew that the empire gave them a status, denied them at home in a class-laden society. Some, in the characteristic British way, hated the foreignness of it all and desired only to make a fortune to return home. Some made the best of things, immersing themselves in a culture of drink and gambling. Those British who went out to run the empire were not entirely from the middle and aristocratic classes. Many ordinary Britons served as common soldiers. Britons in the early years of the 20th century had been raised to take pride in the preeminent place of Britain in the world. The elite of British society was trained to serve the empire either as a member of Britain's armed forces or as civil servants and colonial governors. 
After passing a highly competitive examination, followed by a training in languages, law, and horsemanship, a young Briton in his twenties might find himself ruling a district of the empire as policeman and magistrate. At the very base of this system was the British public school, devoted to making the men who were to rule in the empire's name. The public school provides iconic images of the English system of class and privilege. The curriculum of the English public school was founded upon the classics, the history and literature of ancient Rome and ancient Greece, Roman law, order and discipline, Greek philosophy and ideas of democracy. The classics taught the principles of civilization upon which the British Empire was built. If not studying dead civilizations, the English public schoolboy played games, most usually team sports. Playing for pleasure, playing in gentlemanly friendship, the public school held the professional sportsman in contempt. The public schools in the early years of the 20th century taught their pupils to regard war as the ultimate team sport. The British Empire cannot be understood without realizing the place of sport in the culture of the empire. The public school was devoutly Christian in belief and saw the rest of the world as benighted pagans. This religious foundation connected with the threads of classical civilization and gave the British Empire a firm moral base. However we in the present might condemn or ridicule the past's belief in the white man's burden, in the days of empire there was little humbug or hypocrisy in how the moral duty of ruler to rule was seen. Of course, within the British imperial classes, there were cynics who saw the world as something to exploit, who saw the empire in the purest stark terms of international real politic. The fact remains that amongst the soldiers, governors and missionaries that spread over the world, there was a patronizing assumption of superiority combined with a genuine belief in moral duty and destiny. Even then, at its height of power, the empire was making men who would help bring about its fall. The empire created an educated elite within its subject peoples, an elite who attended the same public schools and believed in the same values of civilization as the imperial masters. These men would challenge the imperial system in its own language and values. The fall of the empire was the result of many different and small currents of history twisting and joining together into one flow, which in the end would sweep the empire away. If the Boer War was a massive shock to the Empire, it was to be as nothing when compared to the cataclysm wrought by World War I. Just two years after the Great Durbar, the King Emperor unilaterally declared war, not just for Britain, but for the Empire as a whole, even though the Dominions were supposedly independent. The popular media were filled with poetical allusion to the lion calling its cubs. For the most part, the Empire did answer loyally, without doubt and without question, seeing Britain's European war as an Australian war, a Canadian war, a New Zealand war, even as a South African war. In the mud of the Western Front, Indian soldiers fought alongside the British. The Dominions believed that fighting was in their self-interest. If Britain were destroyed, the Royal Navy would be destroyed. And without that navy, the independence and freedom of the dominions would no longer be secure from envious predators. The empire marched to war in the same superbly confident spirit of aggressive comradeship that infected Britain. A way of seeing that saw the British Empire as invincible in mind, body and spirit. A popular music hall song gave a new word to the world. Jingoism. We don't want to fight, but by jingo if we do. We've got the guns, we've got the men, we've got the money too. The added strength of the empire did in fact make Britain a formidable adversary to Germany. Britain was the most powerful state to fight the war. With an imperial population of 425 million in 1914, the empire had a massive well of manpower and resources to provide fighting men and industrial muscle to power the conflict. The war helped bring about the empire's fall in many ways, above all, by impoverishing Britain. The fighting did cost men, and money too. 
far more than the Empire could ever imagine, ever wanted to pay, and ever could pay. As the people of Britain and Empire mourned the millions of dead in World War I, the vision of Empire that marched to that war, the Edwardian Empire that preached sacrifice of life in the Imperial cause to be the noblest of acts, was an ideal that nobody could believe, that no one could preach anymore. The war not only destroyed much of the faith in the Empire and its ideals, it estranged and divided the Imperial family. When a British Empire force composed of many Australians and New Zealanders was heavily defeated attacking Gallipoli and Turkey, a defeat that showed that a white European army could be beaten, the battle forever passed into Australian myth as a pointless sacrifice of valiant Australian lives by incompetent British generals. An India, which was growing ever more sophisticated in its politics, expected some reward for its efforts in the Great War. There were many who believed that India should become a dominion, the equal of Australia. When there was no change, the cry of betrayal produced demands from an increasingly articulate Indian elite for complete independence. Perversely, it was in the aftermath of that great war that the British Empire reached its greatest extent. When the First World War ended in the defeat and a descent into chaos and anarchy for the German and Turkish empires, their overseas colonies were stripped away. In the belief that the Great War had been fought to end all wars, the League of Nations had been established as a forum to resolve all international conflict without resort to war. Colonial envy had been seen as the major cause of the terrible war, and the League of Nations took charge of the defeated powers' empires. The League mandated the territories, placed them in trust with the victors in the Great War. This enlarged the British Empire to its greatest physical size, as German East Africa, modern Tanzania, passed into British hands. The map of Africa turned red from the Cape to Cairo. During the Great War, the British had attacked the Turkish Empire by fomenting revolt amongst the tribes of Arabia, promising them independence. In fact, the British had designs on these territories, seeing them after the war as colonized by Indians, creating a vast Arabian colony of the empire, eventually as an Arabian dominion, to be added to the family of the British civilization. It was from the ruins of the Ottoman Turkish Empire that the British were to receive a tiny addition to their domains that in subsequent years was to become its most troublesome province, Palestine. It is impossible to understand how Britain a small island could hold sway over such vast populations all over the world without realizing that those subject peoples gave an unspoken acceptance of the empire and imperial rule. Visible proof of this is the vast number of colonial troops who served in British officered armies. The native troops of India and Africa provided exotic and valuable additions to the forces of the empire. The Indian army was a product of the classic dogma of divide and rule. India's troops were all volunteers, recruited usually from traditionally martial and aggressive minorities within India's diverse society. The military might of all the British and all European empires was to be challenged in the interwar years. Non-European armies became more developed. The European powers grew poorer and less able to grip onto their empires through the power of armies and navies. Britain was unique amongst the great European powers in that the army it placed in the field was not the citizen in arms conscripted to serve, but was traditionally a small force of volunteers with both officers and men drawn from a hereditary class. Britain's army was spread all over the world in tiny communities. The army was more accurately a heavily armed imperial police force, which traditionally fought small wars against less well-armed and organized enemies. The British Empire was not a police state. The army was not everywhere, in continual alert. The vast population, on the whole, lived quiet and orderly lives. What threat there was, was in the wild fringes and border regions. When needed, the British army was a ruthless force, capable of crushing its enemies with a fierce brutality and efficiency. The South African War and World War I had turned this cosy military world upside down. 
but between the world wars, the British army shrank back to its traditional life. The exhaustion of the Great War made these far-flung garrisons ever more difficult to keep. In the mythology of the British Empire, the army stood on a lower pedestal. The British Empire was an empire of the sea. Fighting on land, on high mountains, in remote deserts or steaming jungle was always but a small detail in the grand picture of the empire. The British Royal Navy lay at the very heart of all that the empire was. All the empire's people knew from their earliest days that their security rested on the ships of a mighty fleet. That fleet sailed amidst a swirl of legend, its battle honours an endless list of stirring and dramatic victories. The reviews of the fleet by the King Emperor, as here in 1919, were spectacular set pieces of propaganda, demonstrating the ability of the empire to project its power across the planet. The Admiralty would boast that not a single warship had been withdrawn from duty to attend these great assemblies of maritime might. The Navy's professionalism and seamanship were seen to mirror the virtues of empire. The way its sailors carried themselves and kept their ships in spotless perfection was part of what being British was all about. The Navy had found the First World War an unhappy time. There had been no stunning, massive victory. Germany's submarines had proved a difficult adversary. After World War I, Britain could no longer afford the massive fleet and so could no longer afford the empire. Just as with the army, the Royal Navy began a long decline in 1919. Its decline would reflect, and be part of, the Empire's fall. After World War I, the traditional imperial role of the army and navy were challenged by the newly formed Royal Air Force. Among the many far-reaching and dramatic claims made for the new force and the new technology was that the Empire could be more effectively and cheaply policed and controlled from the air. Many of the empire's most troublesome provinces were the most remote, the deserts of Arabia and Africa, the mountains of India's northwest frontier with Afghanistan. The RAF seized these opportunities with the attitude of a business entrepreneur anxious to establish a place in the face of pressure from unfriendly competitors. Against targets that had no air defense system and no anti-aircraft artillery, the RAF's tactics were those of simple terrorism. The British would bomb simple villages as punishment and intimidation. These were easy days for the RAF, with no opposition, with the freedom to cut giant navigation markings on the face of the desert. A few aircraft could achieve in hours a task that would involve many thousands of soldiers marching on foot months. Instead of long painful treks through hostile wilderness, the pilots of the RAF could do the Empire's work and be back for drinks in the mess by six o'clock. It is a historical trick question to ask which European country lost most territory as a result of World War I. The answer is not Germany or Russia, as most reply. The answer is Britain, when in 1919, Southern Ireland became an independent state. Ireland has often been called the oldest British colony. Irish independence was one of the first steps in the fall of the empire, sending a message to the world that Britain was not content to rule an Ireland riven by violence and unrest. The lessons of Ireland sank into the British state and were remembered when, a generation and a second world war later, other provinces of the empire came to be dismantled. Unlike other imperial powers, the British were resolved not to stay where they were not wanted. The grand ceremonials of the Durbar were echoed in modest pageantry that was an important part of the empire everywhere. British children taught to color the map red also took part in Empire Day. Celebrations were held in every school in Britain every year on the 24th of May, Queen Victoria's birthday. Empire Day saw the performance of stirring Shakespeare stories such as Henry V. Children would perform pageants with the peoples and lands of the empire portrayed in fanciful and imaginative costume. As it was in the villages of England, so it was in the far corners of empire. St. George slew the dragon on a thousand village greens, even if that village green be transplanted to Khartoum in the heat and dust of Sudan.
In Australia, the foundation of the first colonies would be reenacted. Replicas of the first sailing ships sailed once more into Sydney Harbour. These ceremonies created a year zero for the Dominions, a new rewritten history that consigned all who had lived and all that had happened before the arrival of Europeans to a dark age of non-time. The 20th century was a hundred years in which technology raced ever faster. The Empire had a long history of using advanced technology to foster development and progress. In between the wars, new 20th century technologies were used to bind the Empire together. It's hard to realize that the inventions of the aeroplane, the cinema and the radio are events still just within living memory. Radio was used to foster kinship between the dominions and to focus the citizens of the empire upon the king emperor. On Christmas Day 1933, for the first time, the whole empire could hear the voice of King George V as he began a royal tradition of broadcasting that remains to this day. It is this personal link between me and my people which I value more than I can say. It binds us together in all our common joys and sorrows. The King Emperor's speech was preceded by programming in which people from all over the empire told of their lives. Through the cinema, the British people could for the first time see what the empire was really like. They were brought to see the empire as a place of adventure and a place of the exotic. Newsreels showed Britain's South Sea Island possessions as sexy places full of dancing girls and primitive tribesmen. Aboriginal Australians as human curiosities. Canadian Native Americans were portrayed as noble savages. The traditions of India as weird diversions. Fiction placed adventure stories in imperial settings, with the British Empire, the wild northwestern frontier of India, and the darkest jungles of Africa as nearly popular a location as America's Wild West for the new feature film dramas. Here in 1937, a newsreel tells the story of the making of a Hollywood biography of David Livingstone. Livingstone was a British 19th century explorer and missionary the discoverer of new lands and regarded as the heroic bringer of both civilization and Christian God to the heart of Africa. The film's producer shows the African extras how they should dance to look like real natives. The Empire saw the new technology of flight as not simply a means with which to cow the rebellious. Flight was a new way to bring the Empire together with travel and trade. The Empire Airship Scheme was an ambitious and bold project to realize this dream. The British government poured investment and subsidy into the construction of the airship's routes and facilities. The airship scheme came to a disastrous end as the maiden flight by the R101 crashed in northern France. In the coming years, the winged aircraft was to take the airship's place. The newsreels of the 20s and 30s filled with reports of a succession of pioneering flights that proved the safety and effectiveness of the new technology. The Empire organized and paid for the creation of a network of air routes. By the late 1930s, there were four flights a week to India, three flights to East Africa, two to Australia. The planes were nearly all flying boats, and the routes were built on a succession of harbors and lakes. It was not a mass transport system, 
By 1938, the largest planes could carry a maximum of only 18 passengers. The Empire was more impressed with the speed at which the Royal Mail could be carried to all parts of the world. For all the luxurious grandeur of Imperial Airways, the British planes were slower and less reliable than other airlines. The heavily subsidized routes were inefficient, comparing badly to the foreign competition. Many British flying to India, even government officials, chose to fly on KLM, the airline of the Netherlands, that had a network of routes to the Dutch Empire in the East Indies. As the 20s slipped into the 30s, to most of Britain's people, the British Empire appeared a modern empire, a familiar force for good that brought progress and civilization. The empire of British propaganda appeared as strong as ever, but already under the surface glamour, a decline had set in and the empire rang hollow. In the 1930s, there would be an awakening unrest in the empire's subject peoples, for whom charismatic leaders would arise to argue forcefully for independence. Britain was increasingly on the defensive, having to justify an empire in which many of its leaders no longer believed. In 1935, the empire celebrated the Silver Jubilee of George V, 25 years of the King Emperor's reign. Once more, the nations of the empire paid homage to the British sovereign in London. All over the empire, celebrations were played out for the newsreel cameras. The Jubilee was regarded as an event of such import that it was chosen as one of the first colour cinema newsreels. George V was an enthusiast for empire, the only British monarch who would live his whole life in the world of king emperors. His grandmother Victoria had been crowned a mere queen. George had hoped to install his sons as governors of the White Dominions. He had, luckily, enough sons to go round. Few of those ecstatic crowds that gathered in London, drawn from across the world, and certainly not the King Emperor himself, would have predicted that in little more than ten years' time, that the last King Emperor, George's second son, would be looking at an empire struggling to recover from another world war, where an accelerating history was changing the world at ever greater pace and driving the British Empire to its fall.